welcome to As It Comes, life from a musician's point of view. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and I've been enjoying getting a bit more variation in my exercise recently. Here in the UK, gyms and fitness centres opened up again a few weeks ago, which was super exciting for me, because that meant that my absolute favourite form of exercise, of which I've been deprived during lockdown, was now back on the cards. I am, of course, talking about bouldering. Oh yes. For those who don't know, bouldering is climbing up short set routes, or problems, without a harness. <laughs> it's the best way to get a full body workout without realising. As you could probably imagine, because I was getting back on the wall after five months, my body undoubtedly had some things to say. Of course, there were the predictable messages, like my fingers saying, oh, we're not as strong as we used to be, or my hands saying, nah, you usually have a bit more skin on your palms before executing this. But there were the more positive messages flowing through my body as well. As I embarked on my first very easy problem, I felt my lats stretch in a way I hadn't experienced in many months. In a good way, of course. As I eased my way up the wall, I felt the corners of my mouth turn upwards. A smile! Perhaps it was the exhilaration of doing one of my favourite hobbies after a long absence. Or maybe the adrenaline of completing a problem without falling. Whatever it was, I was happy. Both my body and my mind. Although my triceps had some things to say the next day. If you haven't tried it before, give bouldering a go. The wonderful thing about it is that you can go at your own pace because there are different levels of problems on every wall, which is also a good way to track your progress as well. I find so many parallels between climbing and music. No two people are going to have the same approach to a problem, because we're all built differently. We have different abilities, we have different strengths, different weaknesses, different world views. It's like approaching a Bach prelude, right? <laughs> There's a real feeling of being in the moment while you're doing it too. As stressful and uncertain life is at the moment, when you're on the wall, you're forced to think only about the problem at hand. Otherwise, you'll just fall off the wall. It's a good workout mentally as well. Quite telling that the roots are called problems and that it implies they need to be solved, requiring planning and working efficiently to get yourself up to the top rather than just flinging your way up the wall. I mean, sometimes that works, but like in music, that can only get you so far. Naturally, some musicians are anxious about activities which may compromise their fingers. To me, being a string player, I've found it actually helps my finger strength. Plus, calluses on the fingertips do come in handy while climbing. And the fact that you have no safety harness, well, you're only going up three or four meters max, whatever that is in feet, and there are crash mats literally everywhere. So just make sure you don't fall on your head, and you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Classic blasé attitude from me. Anyone who knows me knows I say that a lot. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be great. You've got this. It'll be fine. So, speaking of healthy bodies and healthy minds, my guest this episode is classical guitarist Jeffe Young. We spoke a few weeks ago about the importance of exercise and sleep for musicians, as well as Fei's journey in becoming the first Chinese classical guitarist to reach the world stage. We also chat about her new album, which features arrangements and transcriptions of Chinese melodies for guitar. Here's my conversation with Faye. Um, oh, yeah, and also before we start, can I just ask how to pronounce your full name? Xue <laughs> Fei Yang. Xue Yang. Yeah, so Yang's my family. What was your uh, parents probably? This is the thing. I need to ask your pronunciation. <laughs> I am Chinese, ah. but I grew up in New Zealand. Ah, right. right. So um, that's why I, I don't know how to pronounce Chinese oh, names yeah. when they're there in front of me. Your family name Shum, S-H-U-M. So that's, that should be Shum. So Cantonese? like Yeah, Cantonese. So my parents speak Cantonese, not Mandarin. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh. Whereabouts in China are you from? Is it Beijing? Yes, Beijing. So I speak uh, standard Mandarin. <laughs> but I've been to New Zealand. I really love New Zealand. Oh, have you? Oh, brilliant. Whereabouts did you go? 
I toured uh, uh, to fi- five cities with New Zealand uh, uh, National Symphony Orchestra. Oh, yeah. So, what's her name? Auckland? <laughs> yes, Auckland. <laughs> no, Auckland is Australia, sorry. No, no, right. Auckland is New Zealand. That's where I'm from. <laughs> right. And I was supposed to play there again in May, but, you know, New Zealand oh. uh, shut down, so I couldn't go. And Australia in August, but I couldn't go. Yeah, Auckland and there's some other places by the sea, you know, and... Uh, Anyways. Yeah, everything's by the sea in New Zealand. <laughs> You're never more than 40 kilometers from the sea in New Zealand. Oh, true. That's why, I, you know, one of the reasons I love New Zealand, you just love to be near the sea. And also it's very relaxed. Yeah. People are more yeah. relaxed than, you know, London. <laughs> yeah. say, I'd say the pace of life is just quite chilled out. You know, people yeah. relax. There isn't this feeling of, oh, I need to be somewhere on time all the time. Yeah. Exactly. Less of that feeling now, obviously. But... <laughs> In pre-corona times, yeah, you definitely feel that. You know, if you're in a train mm. station, it's just really busy. Yeah. Jeffe, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me remotely. I obviously have to ask this question because it affects every musician, every person in the world, given that we're in this current environment of lockdown here in the UK and everywhere else, most places. But as someone who collaborates with plenty of musicians – playing the guitar, doing lots of chamber music, doing performing all around the world. How does it feel staying in one place for such an extended period of time? What have you been doing to fill your days? Actually, I have been very busy during the lockdown period. It's uh, rare to have such a long period, just uh, not traveling to anywhere. So the good thing is it gives me lots of time to plan to think think deeply what I want to do in the future, what I've been doing to, to reflect what I have done and what I want to do in the future. But of course, the disadvantage is the anxiety, the uncertainty that we don't know when things could go back to normal. But at the same time, I feel that to keep focused on what I'm doing and plan for the future and reflect to some good times in the past, that is the good way to beat <laughs> the anxiety. So I have been learning new repertoire and, and uh, uh, working on the, the future project and I have, I, I have been doing a video series played in my studio and in the garden and I put them on the YouTube and then people liked them and also I've been preparing some promotional materials for my uh, new album Sketches of China coming up so I've been very busy yeah. uh, uh, it's quite a, a nice attitude to take isn't it you know to keep yourself busy and and to reflect on the positivity as you mentioned you know reflecting on the good times and also I think you know it's quite nice when you have something casual like playing in the garden putting it on YouTube people get to see the real you don't they that's right I think people really love the garden videos because I, I don't think many instrumentalists could do that in the garden you know, imagine piano they can't move the piano to the garden or string quartet or well, they cannot meet up so really, really just a guitar, solo guitar. I can take the guitar to everywhere. However, I have to say, the video do look uh, look quite relaxed. But uh, sometimes in the re- reality, you know, that, that could be noise from the road or from the neighbors. Uh, so, well, anyway, but what I mean that I, I worked quite hard on those uh, videos and also the sounds... Yeah, from outdoor, guitar is such a sensitive uh, instrument, so I make sure the sound, uh, you know, recorded well, and I I gained some experiences. So I think my later videos sounded better than the the previous one. So this is all very, very, very good experience, and then I enjoy doing them. Yeah, you learn so much in the process, don't you? And I think what's really important for a lot of people to remember is that how much work goes into these videos. Oh, yeah. These days, there's so much video content going out and it's easy just to be like, oh, another video of 16 squares, people performing together. But there's so much work that goes into it and and to make it look effortless, is, it's a lot of hard work, do you think? Exactly. I think everything's probably the same. You, 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 it, it, well, but maybe that is the end result. As a player, I want people to see I play effortlessly. That, that should be, that they shouldn't see me struggling. But that, of course, there are lots of hard work, uh, you know, being put into the, the, the work. So you, making videos the same, maybe it looks quite simple, just one take. 
not editing and all that, but there are <laughs> a lot of works involved with the light, the sound, and you know, then sometimes I hear the air are playing, so I have to do again, you know, guitar's very quiet. So when I do the quiet bit, you don't want to hear airplane going through. So anyway, but I enjoy it. The thing is, when you enjoy doing something, then all the hard works become not too, <laughs> not, not too troublesome. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. You've got to enjoy it. And then, as you say, it's a bit of a luxury to have the time to really explore doing a project like that, you know, even if it is a bit difficult you know, you have the time just to make it right and let several airplanes go past if it does happen. Definitely. And also, I think that for guitar, it's very suited to this kind of uh, outdoor environment because there are lots of uh, short, charming pieces uh, to play. You know, and we can, I played some more accessible pieces like jazz standards. I just love them. I, I just want to play music I like. And, uh, you know, for pianists, sometimes a classically trained pianist, they, they, they wanted to play big pieces in a sonata, last 30, 30 minutes. And they, they, they probably don't want to play very short pieces. But for us, you know, we have so many short, charming pieces. And I cannot play very loudly in the, in the garden. <laughs> you know, I have to consider a neighbor. But anyway, I, I, uh, uh, yes, I have been enjoying doing those CD series. Nice little bite-sized pieces, yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. And I, I would continue, even lo lockdown finished, I would continue doing some videos. Yeah, in a way, it's sort of a silver lining, isn't it? It's like, oh, this is a new accessible way to present myself. So why, right. not, why not keep going? And also, I find it's quite fascinating that, let's say, if you play a concert at the Wigamore Hall, if it's sold out, 600 people, <laughs> and you put a video online, and that the popular ones could go for, you know, 20K audience in one month or even a half million in, in a year or something. That's just a, somehow you can reach to a, a bigger audience. So that's quite encouraging. Yeah, yeah. Oh, amazing. So you mentioned uh, before we kicked things off officially that you were meant to be in New Zealand earlier this year, which makes me really happy, but also a bit sad mm -hmm. because you didn't get to go. Um, what else were you meant to be doing this year? Well, I, I was supposed to be really busy at the time being now to tour in uh, Australia and a big tour in China and quite a few uh, uh, concerts in UK. So I, I meant to be traveling everywhere <laughs> during the three, uh, you know, between the three continents. But uh, of course, then Australia uh, concerts uh, canceled and the tour in China is reduced to B3. So I'm off to China this Saturday. Fingers crossed that my flight would be still going on Saturday because, you know, there are lots of flights cancelled. Yeah. And also, I would have to be quarantined arriving in China. Everybody has to be quarantined. So that sounds quite yeah. nervous. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So how, how long is the flight from the UK to China? Well, the thing is, because the flights are very few now, uh, each airline only have one flight to one city only in China. So I actually bought this one is indirect by Lufthansa. So one and a half hour to Frankfurt and five hours wait and another 11 hours from Frankfurt to Shanghai. And imagining that wearing the, the, the mask. <laughs> you yeah. Oh, you've got to make sure that you, you take a, some good breaths once in a while. So I'm really not looking forward to the actual trip on the plane and the quarantine time. I'm looking forward to the concerts. but uh, Yeah. I hope you get some seats next to you so that you can spread out and, you know, keep your distance from. Yeah, I hope so too. But I heard from some other people, they said actually the flights were quite full because, you know, it's not many. So anyway, fingers crossed. <laughs> I mean, like, long-haul travelling is hard enough at the best of times, isn't it? And, and now, under this environment, it m must be – I don't know how you, you're going to do it. I mean, I'm sure you will. But, like, for me, when I fly to New Zealand and I get really excited if I find a connection of flights that's only 25 hours, I'm like, yes, right. 25 hours. Because, you know, you do have those options to stop off at every other place and, you know, it takes 60 hours to get home. I know what you've lost a week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Especially from London to uh, Australia, New Zealand, it's really long haul. It's long haul. Actually, for me, I think the hardest uh, time is not okay. On the plane, it's hard. You know, the air is not fresh, and then you can't sleep and all that. But then the hardest for me is the jet lag. You know, with the pressure, you have to rehearse or play next day <laughs> or in two days' time. Then you, you have to sleep. And then when you have the pressure to sleep and it just makes things harder. 
and then when you cannot sleep, then you just feel not energized. So I, I for me, like the jet lag and then the sleep is, you know, they, these are the biggest issue. Mm-hmm. On the plane, I was, I usually I'm all right because I, I feel that nobody could bother me. <laughs> you know, I cannot check email or phone messages. So I, I just feel like it's me time. <laughs> you know, nobody <laughs> could bother me. So that's okay. And I can catch up with some movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good way to think of it, isn't it? When you're on the plane, it's like, it's me time. It's so long as you're comfortable enough, you're off the radar, but it's just dealing with the consequences on the other on the other side i know of some people that take melatonin to try doesn't and sleep. for me oh, no. <laughs> yeah i tried it it really does well you know the, that doesn't doesn't work for me so yeah i tried i tried all kinds of things <laughs> yeah. sleep. i think the best thing really for sleeping is exercise if you but the thing is sometimes you don't have the time <laughs> I have to to be able to sleep well. I have to do at least run five k. You know, if you just run one k, doesn't work because I regularly regularly exercise. So I have to exercise a lot to make myself feel tired. Then I can sleep. So, yeah. but sometimes when you just arrive at somewhere, you don't have the time to exercise. You know. Yeah, it's like straight to the hotel room, straight to rehearsal, and then oh, you know. Yeah, or or, or during the night, so like up to six a.m. Especially going to Asia because the time is ahead. So you, you cannot go to the gym, you know, between 1 and 6 a.m. You have to, to lie in the bed. And then you couldn't, when after 6 a.m. you started to be sleepy. That, that you can go to the gym, but you started to be sleepy. And in the afternoon you have to rehearse. So it just, the time is everywhere. <laughs> it's an uphill struggle, it sounds like. <laughs> it can be, yeah. yeah. In the ideal way, it would be good to have uh, quite a few days before the activities to give you time to sink in. But uh, usually, usually you don't. <laughs> So anyway, but that's the bad side of the (laughs) traveling. It's really nice to hear you place the importance on exercise because I think uh, I think a lot of musicians do forget that. And I I was speaking to another podcast guest just last week who said, you know, we really should regard ourselves as athletes because Mm. what we do is so physical and we need to be in tip top shape. Have you been running for a long time? Is that something that has helped you sustain your performing career? I think so. I I, I agree with that. Uh, what you said. I've been doing it for probably ten years. I I really hate running when I was a teenager. You know? But uh, the thing is, I I go attend. Do you know this? The park run on every Saturday is across the country, or even in New Zealand, I think, or Australia. Yeah. Yeah, 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 they have them around the world. Yeah, that's right. So when you're in a group, and then you feel it's a bit different, you know, more fun. But I think that exercise is very important to keep not only physical shape but also mental shape as well. And as you say, we musicians are very uh, demanding physically and mentally. Okay, maybe playing guitar. The actual playing bit is not as physical as playing cello or piano. But imagine, imagine that when you travel. Uh, to different continents and this is very physical and then you know the sleep issue and then man- mentally you deal with lots of stress so I think that the exercise to make you feel strong physically first and you feel stronger mentally and then you can deal with your playing and your the stress it's I think it, it's very important because I don't know who has that saying that a strong body support a strong brain or, or something oh, like that um, uh... Is it the Latin say? Oh, I'm going to look it up. And also during the lockdown period, you know, I, I would imagine most of the people suffers a little bit uh, anxiety, more or less, right? And the doing exercise, well, you know, if you, we, we were allowed to go out the door once a day and do some exercise, that's also very important to beat those blues, I think. Oh, totally. So I think the phrase that you mean, I think you mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the Latin phrase anima sana in corpore sano. Which okay, great. translates as healthy soul in a healthy body. Yeah, great. <laughs> That's <laughs> ideal. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know who said that, but I know the sports brand Asics. You know, they do yeah. like shoes and everything, but that's what Asics stands for. Oh, lo- like a, a motor or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, but the acronym A S I C S, Asics, yeah. in anima. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, it's a good a good thing to remember, I think, to remind ourselves, I think. Yeah, exactly. You've got you've got to have both hand in hand, not yeah. just one or the other. Exactly. And also I feel that as a as an artist or I, I think a lot, you know. You, you can get lost in your own thoughts. <laughs> so go out, do some exercise and to distract your 
sometimes if you think too much and then it become yeah. <laughs> too much <laughs> and also i find um talking to people helps as well uh, oh. doesn't it you know to distract yourself from your internal monologue and yes. sometimes if i just call up a friend or something or even just talking to you and then you realize <laughs> <laughs> you realize oh i'm not the only person that has these internal struggles you know everyone does and it, and it helps yeah. talking about yes. it so in a way, I think it's kind of, uh, we all need a friend and family. We all need to talk to someone to express, uh, communicate. So yeah, it's very important. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful hearing that insight. So for those who aren't super familiar with you, you're a guitarist, as you've mentioned. Can you tell us a little bit more about your journey into playing the guitar? Because you grow up in China. After the Cultural Revolution, which finished in the mid mid nineteen seventies, yeah, yeah, and you know, growing up in an in an environment as such where in the past Western instruments and music were banned, so how did you get into playing the guitar? It was a destiny for me. I, I didn't even know what a guitar was really. <laughs> I was growing up after that period, it sounded like a completely different world, but China started to open already, slowly. So I was just an active child, and then my parents wanted me to learn an instrument to calm me down, to be able to more concentrate in, in, a, in the academic. Uh, to calm you down. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because uh, they, I'm very, you know, active, very <laughs> energetic. So, and also that it started to be trendy to get your, your children to, to learn some music. So, so yeah, multiple reasons, but really mainly is to, to get me to study well. You know, this uh, to get your children study well is very, very important for the Chinese parents. But they thought about accordion at first because accordion was a very popular instrument. Basically, accordion was like the portable piano to accompany lots of choirs. There were lots of choirs. So they talked to the music teacher in my primary school to teach me accordion. But then that teacher, she was organizing a children's choir, but using guitar to accompany. <laughs> so she just put me in the guitar group, this choir playing guitar. And, uh, and then that's it. I didn't, I remembered really vividly. I kept asking my dad, what's that instrument called? Because I thought guitar, it sounds very uh, exotic. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. And then my dad bought a little guitar. It cost uh, 20 yuan, so $3 <laughs> from the shop, a little one. I, and then I, I, I opened the case and I plugged the string. I thought it's like a toy, <laughs> you know, like a nice toy for me. So, but luckily, luckily, I, from the very beginning, I loved, uh, you know, I enjoyed playing the guitar because nobody pushed me to be a whatever musician or have to be like this or that. It's just a hobby from the beginning. So I enjoyed it from the, right from the beginning. Yeah. So. And I think that that raises quite an interesting point because you were the first Chinese classical guitarist mm. to reach the main stage. So mm. obviously you didn't have the role models to look up to no. or you didn't even really have recordings to, to refer to. And why is it, you know, because I would say that the representation of Chinese musicians in say stringed instruments or pianos quite high, but why not guitar? Why, why did the guitar start with you? <laughs> Well, yes, it's a very long, I have come, <laughs> come a long way and it's a long story. So generally in China, there, there was a long, longer tradition to strings and the piano or even the vocal. And it, they'd already had the tradition before the Cultural Revolution. But guitar was a really a new thing. So before the Cultural Revolution, there, people don't, didn't know about the guitar. There were probably some foreign teachers. They came into China to teach some wealthy families' children and then they play a bit of guitar as a hobby. So that's the first, you know, first uh, that guitar came into China. And that was probably during 1920s, uh, 30s, when Shanghai was very bubbly. So really there wasn't a tradition of guitar in China because, you know, even in the Western countries, the guitar is only just from, let's say, early 20th century because of Andres Segovia. He's made all so much effort to make a guitar recognized in the conservatoire and on the concert stage. So really, we, we are kind of a newer instrument <laughs> compared to strings and piano. And in China, it's also the same same case. So after the Cultural Revolution, then the piano, strings, vocal, they, they did basically, they revived to you know, to what did they have before, and people knew about these things. But then guitar was seen as a bad instrument somehow, you know, hooligan instrument. Because I say that, uh, you know, at that time, China just started to open up. 
and this Western capitalism is seen still not very nice.、Mm. So I remember this kind of image of Beatles and、uh, you know pop musicians and then the long hair, <laughs> this kind of、uh, genius and playing guitar. This is a bad image, <laughs> <laughs> not criminal, but you know not very nice image. So、uh, lots of people relate、uh, guitar to such a Western capitalism. Yeah.、Uh, image. So even when I picked up guitar, my parents were both teachers, and some of their intellectual friends said, "Oh, why, why let you、like、play guitar?" You know, it's, it's a bit, bit of that. But of course, there are still some people they like the guitar, whether they play just、uh, uh, accompanying their、uh, singing or play、uh, a few pe- people play classical. But there were a small group they play guitar. But it's still a novelty. And as you said, there wasn't the resources. <laughs> very, very few. Some people maybe they had the CDs they bought from abroad and then they took it back to China and then we made copies and copies and copies because otherwise we、we'll, we、we'll、lose them and there, there wasn't internet you know、yeah. and the radio occasionally played I remembered the radio played John Williams、uh, Spanish music and then my dad oh my dad heard it the guitar and I recorded it on the cassette cassette is quite expensive also not for us. Is luxurious, so he recorded and made a few copies, make sure that I had it, and I just loved, really loved, loved that recording. So yeah, this is an environment. But then, so at the first, I I was、uh, playing the guitar as a hobby, and then my teacher, the first teacher, she's an amateur、uh, player too. She realized that I was much quicker than others. I had talent, and then she saw the ad on the newspaper. There was going to be a first Chinese international guitar festival in Zhuhai. So she wanted me to attend to that festival, and then somehow she she found out that the director he's a guitar teacher. So she brought me. To this guy, and so he became my teacher for the next ten years, and then I was able to attend the guitar festival, and yeah. So, and then with this teacher, then he told me that I should go into the music school, proper music school, to get the formal training because I I had the talent to be professional, and then but there's no music school which had the guitar faculty, and it's just a long fight. <laughs> you know, they have to talk to the school. My parents had to pay a lot of money, and then they didn't want to. They wanted me to go to a normal school, good、oh, normal. School. Yeah, get a get a proper job. <laughs> yeah, a good university, like my brother. My brother's path, you know, good school, good uni, good job, stable. And the guitar, what can you do with guitar? No role model, no profession, and also even from the school back then, that、uh, they still allocate jobs to college graduates. Uh, back then, now they don't do that. And、uh, what are they going to allocate to a guitar student? <laughs> you know,、yeah. uh, so all of these problems, anyway. So in the end, very reluctantly, my parents led me to be in the music school.、Uh, but there wasn't a official guitar major, so I was unofficial. And then the teacher was that director of the guitar festival. Wow! So you really had to kind of. I don't really want to say fight, but yeah, you ha- really had to like push to to make it happen, and not just you, but your family as well. To as you were saying, the guitar is a new instrument. You're making history as it was happening. Well, looking back, when people call me pioneer, I thought, oh, that sounds really fancy. But <laughs> but when you are experienced, when you are on the path, when you are, there wasn't a path basically, and you go through the field and you have to step out a path. It's actually not, not looking back. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you are a pioneer because you paved the way for many more musicians to to follow that path after you. But at the time, you're just thinking, "This is just what I have to do. I just gotta, I just gotta get my BA in, in guitar." <laughs> but you're not, you're not thinking with the end point of, "I'm going to be a musical pioneer." Yes, exactly. I, I didn't think about this pioneer thing. There's more, lots of more practical thing to think about. You're paying for the school fee, and the, you know, to to hope that the school will have the de- the, the, the major, so I can graduate with a degree. You know, lots of practical things. So it's just.、Uh, No, no, no space to think about being a pioneer. Yeah, yeah. And then, what led you to come to London? So during my school years, I had the opportunities to perform in Europe, Spain, and Portugal, and Australia and Japan. 
So I knew that I, I just I knew that I wanted to, to 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 study in the West because you know this is basically guitar is a Western instrument and that the environment in my head the environment would be much better <laughs> in the Western countries. My parents actually wanted me to go to the U.S. because my brother was already studying in the U.S. So they would think if I go to U.S. I have my big uh, older brother to look after me. <laughs> but I kind of had this strong head. I wanted to go to Europe. <laughs> I had never been into U.S. UK, in UK, but I just had this feeling that London would be a great place to speak English and it's more international. I, I wanted to go to Europe. And then, so, and I, luckily I got the full scholarship from uh, ABRSM to be able to study in the academy. How many years have you been in London now? 20 years. <laughs> 20 years. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. I've only yeah. been here for uh, seven and a half. <laughs> Did you come here to study? Um. But sort of not. I didn't study at a college here in London. Um, but I did South Bank Sinfonia, which is oh. is like a training orchestra for oh. like recently graduated musicians. But um, you basically spend ten months in this orchestra with thirty other people. You know, okay. you you are your own orchestra for the year, and you oh. put on a, a series of concerts every week. Yeah, you spend time together, and you also just get professional development training as well. So oh, that's good. it was a really, really lovely thing to do. And, and I, I can't imagine what I would be doing if I hadn't done that, because that's what literally brought me to London. And I'm still here. <laughs> um, but I was lucky to have done it because they hold auditions in New Zealand and Australia. So I didn't oh. have to come over here to audition. Oh, I see. So mm. you, you could guarantee you a place and then you came here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. So I thought we'd move on now and talk about your new album, which is coming up, which you mentioned earlier. And it features arrangements of Chinese melodies, a lot of which you've arranged yourself. And I mean, I think when people think of classical guitar repertoire, it's easy to think of Spanish repertoire or South America. But tell us a little bit more about the philosophy behind this album. Definitely. People relate to guitar to, to Spain mostly. And to be honest, at the beginning, there is zero Chinese repertoire for guitar. But this is a really, this album is a dream come true for me. For so many years, 20 years in my career, I've toured around the world. I've played music from everywhere. And uh, when you see a lot of different uh, culture and lifestyles and play a lot of different music, I just feel even more desired to play music from my own culture you know I'm a Chinese <laughs> and actually even when I was in the school um, school times and my peers my classmates either on the piano or violin they had to play some Chinese music on their instruments for exam and even back then I envied them that they could play some music where we are familiar with because Chinese music for us is like speaking Chinese. So I have been actually doing this is a long project I've been doing for 20 years, transcribing some Chinese music, either it's traditional or folkloric or modern music. And I try to ask some composers, whether Western or Chinese composers, to write music for guitar using the Chinese music elements or using some Chinese culture. So this is, I've been doing it for 20 years, but I have been a, a playing or recorded one or two pieces here and there. And this is the first time I dedicated the whole album <laughs> to Chinese music because I felt that the time is ready. As an artist, uh, after 20 years of experiences, I've collaborated with a uh, lot of musicians, including Western or including Chinese instrumentalists, and I have done lots of transcriptions, you know, Spanish, Bach, and Chinese. And then I, I feel like uh, with more knowledge, you could relate everything together and you have the more confidence knowing that why you do this, why you transcribe that way. So I feel that I'm, I'm ready to present this album. And also I felt like lots of people think that guitar is lacking of repertoire. <laughs> I think it's yes and no, you know, okay, we, we're lacking of the mainstream repertoire, like uh, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, or this uh, German, Austrian mainstream repertoire we don't have much. But we could play everything, you know, South American, you know, jazz standard. And uh, so I think Chinese music very suited to play on the guitar because there are lots of plucked instruments in China, guzheng, pipa, liu qin, and guitar is a plucked instrument. So I feel like there are lots of things that I could adapt uh, on, onto my, my instrument, so lots of music and even the technique or the sound. And to be honest, the guitar was traced back from the Middle East. 
uh, same as the pipa, you know, Chinese root, and then pipa and guitar went to different <laughs> uh, root and different families. So I feel like the root wasn't too far, you know, <laughs> from our ancestors to the to the Eastern music. So I think that uh, I wanted to bring this whole new world of new sound and new music onto my instrument. And also, very importantly, I feel that it's a bit a responsibility for me as a Chinese artist to promote our culture. I feel that, uh, you know, there's so much talk about <laughs> China, you know, getting a lot of awareness on the stage, but not much talk about culture. In, in the end of the day, China has 5,000 years of culture. And uh, so this is something that I think people should pay more attention to. And this album is so far is the, the one that I have dedicated much, the most the time and energy and everything, you know, into it. So, mm. yeah, I, I hope to be honest, in uh, maybe in, in another 20, 30 years time, this could be my legacy. For... Yeah. Well, as you say, it is the kind of thing that you need to build up the experience to do, don't you? Because, I mean, this is 20 years of experience versus 5,000 years of history. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I say that, for example, 20 years ago, I did my first transcription of Chinese piece. But the thing is, when you do something at uh, first, you wouldn't know the effect. You wouldn't know how it, it goes. But so I, I did the first piece and I played it in the concert and people loved it. So, oh, you know, and then you, you knew this work, this work, and then you started to do more. And then you, you learn more that how, what works on your instrument and then, you know, <laughs> what doesn't work so well. So this kind of thing. And with more knowledge, I, I could uh, actually use them as well. For example, the single that's already out called The Lovely Rose is a classic folk song. And then you probably think that, oh, the beginning sounded a bit like Spanish music. But I say that music from that northern western area of China, they actually have some similarity to, let's say, Moorish music. And the Moorish music is a big element in the Spanish music. So when you have the knowledge, and also I played a little bit of flamenco, just to try to practice a little bit of, of our technique. It's a little bit different, oh, very different from classical guitar, but I could use that with technique and then the knowledge of the sound onto doing this. Uh, so that's what I say with more experience, with more knowledge, and you can really twine them together. Yeah. It's all connected, isn't it? And I think that everything that you do is just another tool that you can use to inform something else that you do. So I'm sure mm -hmm. if there is another Chinese classical guitarist who has the same idea and wants to do you know, similar sort of transcriptions, it won't be exactly the same because, you know, your your mode of delivery is going to be slightly different. <laughs> yeah, it's different, yes. Yeah. It's very personal yeah. also. This journey has been a very personal one. So, yeah, so this is a very important. I thought we'd move on now. So as I mentioned before, I have a segment in my podcast called the Wildcard Question Round. Wow. <laughs> This is where you have the opportunity to choose what I ask you next based on three topics that I present you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so your topics are guitar repertoire for the uninitiated, food, <laughs> okay, and hobbies. Hobbies. I think food or guitar repertoire. Mm. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I feel like I should be talking about guitar up to Let's talk about guitar repertoire. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So with guitar repertoire, can you tell us a piece that you would introduce to a newcomer that would introduce them to the wonders of the guitar? Someone doesn't know guitar at all, you mean? Yeah. Someone someone mm. and you want to present them a piece that will make them go great. <laughs> I, I feel that if someone really, they have no idea a classical guitar, let's say guitar sounds like, and I want them to fall in love with guitar immediately, then probably my first choice would be Ricardo de la Alhambra. <laughs> I feel this piece could uh, have the most chance to get people fall in love with our instruments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What sort of features does it have? I don't, I'm, I'm not familiar, unfortunately. So don't worry. So Alhambra is this uh, uh, this amazing Moorish uh, palace in, in Granada. Oh, in Spain, yeah. Yeah, yeah and Ricardo is the memory, so memory of the Alhambra. 
it's a piece very beautiful and it's tremolo so basically well, i love it because it, it feels like my bow you know oh, <laughs> sure yeah because guitar is a plucked instrument oh, i love bold instrument or singing so with tremolo you basically can, you can sustain the, the, the line like a bow yeah and that's so apparently well, it is said that the composer francisco terriga wrote this piece for his lava that's why it's so romantic but also you can imagine the fountains, the beautiful scenes in the in the palace. It's just a really romantic, very, very beautiful piece. And I find that lots of people, they, they know nothing about guitar. And then they listen to this piece and they say, oh, it's so beautiful. I love guitar, you know. So, yeah, yeah. so it paints, it paints a very romantic picture. I'm going to look that up. I, I don't actually know the piece. I have a video on my YouTube, so if you can, you could look it up. And also the very exotic, I think that for me that I've been to the palace two times, especially if you've been there and you you can just vividly, vividly imagine the the, the, the scene. It's just, uh, and plus with the feeling, I just. Uh, it's amazing that something like that can be represented so faithfully in sound. Yeah, that's right. And also this is one of the pieces I never get bored of playing, you know, I just uh, never get bored of playing it. Mm -hmm. So I think this is also a good test that uh, for me, that one of the tests that a great piece or what a great piece is that is that you, you don't get bored easily. <laughs> yeah, that you're always finding something new. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's I think right. for me as as a cellist, you know, we have the massive works of, of J.S. Bach. So we have the Bach cello suites. Um, <laughs> and I know there are times where sometimes I'm like, oh, I, I don't want to play this or it's too hard. But, you know, there are times where you sit down and you haven't played them in a while and you just think, oh, my goodness. For one thing, it's a really good way to sort of track your own progress musically, I think. But then also, you're always finding something new every time you sit down. Yeah, Bach, it's really something that you can play until you're 19, <laughs> I guess. And I mean, I imagine you probably can play for your whole life and you always find something new and never get bored of. So, yeah. How do you do tremolo on the guitar? Use, uh, so the classical guitar where is this straight or oh, you can't see a video right you use ami finger to do the tremolo so like uh, rotate and the thumb to do the bass accompaniment mm -hmm. so with the flamenco guitar they use four fingers they repeat uh, they repeated the eye finger the eye what's the first finger you mean uh, yeah the, the first finger yes so they do every four notes with a thumb to do the bass and then on pipa they use five fingers, <laughs> all the five fingers on the right hand. And uh, on Madeline, so they use you pick, you know, pick, mm -hmm. uh, basically to just uh, do it quickly, picking yeah. the string quickly. Yeah, oh, that's, I find that really interesting because obviously when we do tremolo, and if there are any non-musicians listening, tremolo literally means to shake. But that's what we do as, as a stringed instrumentalist. We, you know, you shake the bow. But like you have to use individual digits to do that. Use fingers and, the, and then you, you rotate very uh, quickly and also evenly. Yeah. I have to, I've heard a violinist to play that uh, Alhambra. So they just, uh, um, how, how do you say that technique? You know, you just uh, shake your, your ball. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I just had to mention because you have, you have to have quite long fingernails to play the guitar, don't you? you, you yes, you have, a, well, I say a bit of fingernails on the right hand and the left hand, same as you or violinist, you cannot have fingernails to, to mm. press down. So, yeah, one hand has fingernails, one doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> You've got your scratching hand. <laughs> yeah. Well, that put off some young girls to learn the guitar, or boys, you know, they think, oh, they don't want to have nails. Well, I think that's really a very small, very small thing, you know, to sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've just got to get over that, don't you? I haven't had long nails in a long time, you know, and, and there are some people that um, really love having long fingernails, but I, I feel like I'd just get really annoyed with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, it's true because you have to protect it. That's the thing during the travel travels, you know, carrying luggage or guitar case or you're doing zips, you have to be very careful with, as a guitar guitarist, I have to be very careful with my right hand. So I try to use the left hand all the time because even my nails broken. Oh, that would be a disaster <laughs> to play. God, yeah, it's, it's kind of like your bow breaking or something before a performance. What do you do if you break a nail? Well, it happens. For example, recently, oh, actually, my last concert in Ireland. So I was doing this, you know, like kind of a bar talk, you know, on, on guitar. So I just a boom, a, a big sound. 
Oh, Bartok pits, yeah, where you slap the string on yeah, the finger. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. A very loud sound. And that maybe the angle wasn't quite right. And then my thumbnail was like halfway. It's just a split. I said, oh, God, what am I going to do before the concert? And luckily, the head of guitar in the Irish Academy was there. So I asked her to help. And then she found her student coming to the concert to buy some super glue for me. And I was worrying about the first that if they could find super glue because it's a half an hour to the concert. And then still, because I've never used super glue, I worry about even this glue did. I had the whole concert to play and I have to do the battle and all that. Would, it, would that be all right? Because it's really heavily split, you know. And then so they got the super glue and they put it on and she put it on for me. And uh, luckily it was fine. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so carry around some super glue in your guitar case from now on. <laughs> Yeah, and I realized, oh, well, so unprofessional that I didn't carry super glue with me. I should be carrying super glue with me all the time, just in case, you know. So I thought, because usually, usually it happened very rarely because I had the strong nails. But anyway, that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got your yeah. spare strings and your super glue in the case. Oh, yeah, and a lot of others, you know, like a, as small as a hair clip, you know, and uh, all sort of things. <laughs> you know? Yeah, the things a musician's a case is always very enlightening, I think. Yeah, loads. And if you miss one thing, and that could cause you trouble. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up that piece. Um, I, I think... I'm going to educate myself on guitar repertoire because I don't know much about it. So it's been really wonderful talking to you about it and hearing about your journey and your, your path and your life at the moment under lockdown. So thanks so much for your insights. So where can people find out more information about yourself and follow you? Um, I have a Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and I have a Weibo in China <laughs> and uh, you know, TikTok and everything I have. <laughs> many so choose choose a platform wow how do you have time for all of that i have two social media accounts i'm like oh it's too much for me i'm so tired <laughs> well honestly i have been because during this period because uh, i couldn't manage this because i'm not traveling and not playing concerts so i thought okay let's give a bit more time to to be connected to the audience but it, it is how to say it is overwhelming for example, I, I realized that there is this feature that you, how, how you can put music in the Instagram story. Apparently, it's been there for almost two years, but I didn't know. It's overwhelming, and each platform is different. And then at the same time, I have a few in China. But then I thought that it is important. I've spent so much energy to, to make this album, Sketches of China, happen and, and previously. And then now I need the people to hear them. So I need to, and I have time now to, 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 to try to be connected to the audience. Yeah. Thank you so much. We'll tell people to look out for your new album and find you on all your various social media platforms. And thanks so much for being on the podcast. That was my chat with the wonderful Zhe Fei Young. I hope you travel in concerts in China. First of all, I hope they went. And if they did, I hope they went well. This week's Music College Didn't Prepare Me contribution comes from Christina Maroney, a bassoonist. Music College didn't prepare me for the time I arrived for a concert in Flensburg, Germany, where they'd lined the entire front of the stage with lilies, which I'm very allergic to. I spent the pre-show rehearsal with streaming eyes, trying desperately not to cough or sneeze down my bassoon, and struggling to breathe whilst trying to play solos in Wagner and Strauss. I spoke to the orchestral manager, and about ten minutes before the concert, this little lady who was part of the tea team came up to me with a bag full of antihistamines and an inhaler that apparently her doctor husband had been hoarding in their bathroom cabinet for years. They worked a treat. I hear you, Christina, and thank you for your contribution. <laughs> I think usually the body somehow eliminates the need to sneeze and cough during performances because you're so in the zone. But as you found out, there are circumstances where the urge to do so is just so bad. The reflexes totally override that ability. Thank goodness for antihistamines, though. You've inspired me now to put some tablets in my cello case for outdoor gigs, along with my spike stopper, pencil, humidity regulator, and if I were a guitarist super glue. Remember, if you have something that Music College didn't prepare you for, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com. 
That's it for today. Special thanks to Roz Nagy for my logo and Daniel Elms for my jingle. Enormous thanks to Faye for chatting to me as my guest. And particular thanks this week to Rebecca and Tessa at Premier Classical for their assistance in this episode. And as always, thank you for listening. Do get in touch, should you wish, at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com or via my website, which is asitcomes.com. Like and follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at asitcomespod. Remember to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you for spreading the word. Chat to you soon. Bye. Bye.